Hi booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a recent reads. Sorry it's been a while since the last one but as I mentioned in that uh, I am writing a new book and uh, when I write I don't have much time or headspace to read and also there's always that fear that whatever you're currently reading sort of um, leeches into your into your work by osmosis. Um, so this probably covers about three weeks or a month uh, worth of reading. I would say that I've almost finished the first draft. Uh, I wasn't doing NaNoWriMo, which is the writer novel in November, but for some reason I always seem to shadow, not always, but I seem to shadow it a lot, whereby I happen to be writing a novel in November. Um, partially down to me not using my annual leave and having to use it before the end of the year and uh, always seem to end up in November and um, what better than to sit down and write. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about um, these books. St Sebastian's Abyss by Mark Haber, Hangman by Maya Binyam, a novel from an American Iranian. This is called Translating House One and was uh, written by Pupe uh, Misagi and I first saw that on uh, Chris Veer's Leaf by Leaf's uh, booktube channel and finally um, some Victor Pelevin, The Yellow Arrow. But I'm going to start with a preamble by way of talking about this book, San Sebastian's uh, Abyss. And the preamble I'm going to give is I'm just going to sort of share a few thoughts on comedy in um, novels, in literature. Uh, I think comedy is really hard to do. It's hard to pull off. There's a difference between reading silently to yourself, you know, alone, and being in a darkened auditorium and seeing a stand-up comic or watching a carefully scripted um, TV comedy with actors delivering their lines, things like that. Um, it's... It's much harder to get belly laughs uh, from reading a book, from words uh, on a page, printed on a page. Um, I like to think that I am a comedic writer in parts, uh, but again, I would acknowledge that wordplay uh, can bring a titter of appreciation rather than a sort of, as I say, a guffaw of laughter. So it's quite hard to... to, to you know, be funny on every single page of a novel. And let's face it, we call our genre in this neck of uh, booktube's woods, we call it serious literary fiction. Uh, that there, you know, there might be a feeling um, that comedy in a way undermines the serious nature, the high mindedness of, of, you know, beautifully crafted words and philosophical ideas and stuff. I don't hold to that, but it is very easy to um, sort of wreck your own ship if if there's too much slapstick or cheap laughs or and that kind of thing in the show notes i will put down a list of uh books that i find funny um uh whether all of them are strictly literary fiction is open f uh, for debate uh but I'll, I'll put that list in in the show notes anyway so that's sort of generally about comedy in books and, and then there's the nature of different types of comedy, because Chris Rock has um, talked about uh, the comedy that punches down, where people in a position of power or a greater status, such as celebrities or politicians, um, target people without the same status, without the same power. It's called punching down, and it's usually, you know, a pretty cheap laugh, um, you know, often unmerited. Whereas he talks about punching up when comedians are often targeting politicians, people in power, uh, for their corrupt or craven practices. And Rock would argue, and I think I'd probably agree, that, you know, that's a more than justified, um, you know, sort of punching, really. Um, that it's one of the few modes of expression we have outside of an election to try and, you know, grab hold of the lapels of our politicians and people in power and shake them to make them listen if, you know, if we get under their skin with some comedy. Um, so 
I'm going to talk about three specific examples before I get to the book that I'm actually going to talk about. So in Much Ado About Nothing by William Shakespeare, and yes, there's always the caveat that Shakespeare's humour doesn't necessarily translate that well across the centuries to our own modern day. Um, and also that I studied this uh, at school, so it's a long time ago, my memory ain't great. Um, so there's two, there's two different types of comedy in the book, uh, in the play. The first is, you know, the sort of aristocratic families of Benedict and Beatrice, the two lovers who are at each other's throats, and they hurl abuse and jibes at each other the whole time because underneath that they're desperately in love and, you know, they're going to come together and get married and all of that. Um, but it's wordplay. And, of course, Shakespeare was a master of, of, of sort of wordplay. Um, but they, they, they keep it contained with each other and their own class. They don't punch down. Uh, and then the other uh, layer of humour in the book is um, the sort of yeoman night watchman led by Dogwood. Uh, so where Benedict and Beatrice are masters of words, uh, of hurling words, Dogwood is someone who's overwhelmed by words, that he mispronounces or uses the wrong word often, and that's where the humour comes from. But again, the two never cross lines, so they're not punching down, and Dogwood's not really punching up. They aren't his targets. He's lost in his own, his own world. And I think, <coughs> I think that's perfectly legitimate. The problem I have is that somehow that can get mutated into um, modern comedy, whereby... If you take now, this may only resonate with British audiences, although I'm sure it's is is shown abroad. This is probably the Britain's most favourite and popular um, sitcom. I hated it. It's called Only Fools and Horses, and it was about it was during the sort of the grim 1980s where everyone was on the make on the fiddle. Um, so the rich boys were, were on the stock exchange making lots of money doing shady deals on sort of futures, <laughs> on the, you know, things that didn't actually exist. Um, but whereas the, you know, those people who were not so privileged were sort of running market stalls where they were selling, you know, black market goods, basically, or, or cheap knockoffs and counterfeit. And this is about a family of, of them, two brothers, and the problem I have with... Well, I have two problems with the programme. One is every character is stupid. Uh, you know, the, the main character is crafty and sly because he's on the make and, and he can sort of manipulate wheel and deal and, and that. But the humour is all drawn from them, like Dogwood, being sort of stymied by words, not really understanding the words they use and using the wrong words in the wrong places. Um, whereas... It, in the context that Shakespeare did it, it was funny because you also had this, you know, this sort of the stuff with Benedict and Beatrice going on. Whereas here it is entirely set within the world of where everybody is stupid and everyone uh, abuses language, really. The other reason I hate it is because it's sentimental, because the way the writers pull back from us going, oh, these people are too stupid to believe is that they have a core of sentimentality and their sort of family ties always bring them back to the as you know a layer of humanity um but i hate that program whereas where you get um something like basil 40 in four, in 40 towers played by john cleese you've got you've got a, an interesting thing there going on there because uh basil 40 is a snob an elitist he hates the riffraff as he sees it but he has he relies on you know he runs a hotel he relies on them for his income but what he really wants, he aspires to join the, you know, the, the, the aristocratic or, or at least the, you know, the well, well off and wealthy people in the town, the hotel is. But of course, he's so middle class, they will never accept him. So he's trying to punch down, but he in turn is getting punched down by those above him. And I think that works. Um, and, you know, you realise, at least within this sort of strain of British humour, there's an awful lot about class. And that determines, I think, the success or failure. Again, it comes back to what Chris Rock was saying about punching up and punching down. In Britain, there are programmes that punch up at, at sort of, you know, power elites and stuff. But it's also punching up and punching down within class, where people might not really have power as, you know, politicians wield it, but they still have power because of their class and their privilege. 
And a lot of British humour derives from that. And I, as I say, I think Forty Towers is successful in a way that only Fools and Horses isn't. Anyway, all by the by, because uh, I saw someone talk about this book on Twitter. They said it was the funniest book they'd read this year. So I thought, right, I'm in. And indeed, it's not a very long book. It's about 144 pages. And it is one extended gag, uh, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the success of this book will come down to whether you find that gag funny or not. Uh, and if you find it funny initially, is it sustained? The problem I had was, although initially I was sucked in, uh, I didn't really find the whole worked. It didn't amuse me uh, across its length. Uh, it is about punching down. Um, it's about two uh, guys who meet at art school in Oxford. One is American, one is Austrian or German, I can't remember. Um, and as part of their course, they have this textbook and they discover this painting uh, in it. It's uh, quite an obscure painting. No one else seems to be that sort of familiar with it. But they're both smitten by it. And they go and see it. It's hung in a museum in, in Barcelona. It's, by, it's a 16th century painting by a Dutch guy uh, called Beckenbauer. It's not real, by the way. This, this is all made up. And, and props to the author for creating this, you know, this sort of... In the le level of detail that make, you know, makes you think it's a real painting. Um... And only three paintings by this guy exist. Uh, this, this painting that they both pronounce is the best painting in the whole history of art. Uh, and these two, what they call monstrous monkeys, that sort of, you know, they can't believe it's by the same guy. And it's, they're hung either side of it, either side of the painting that they love. And, and they were, you know, it's like an eyesore. They always have to sort of shield their eyes from it just so they can focus on their beloved painting. And these two guys make their living off writing book after book after book about this one painting. Um, you know, they both have double figures number of books and they're friends as well as sort of gentle rivals, but they are united in their love of this painting and their sort of campaign to get it recognised by the art elite as the best painting in their history of art. Um, and, you know, it's quite funny in the, it starts off in the language it uses because Haber is very much channeling Thomas Barnhard here because there's that sort of Barnhardian sneer uh, at, you know things that Thomas Barnhard doesn't like in this case it's the plebs you know art isn't for the plebs art is only for the elite for the people who can write 10, te 10 books about one painting so there is an intellectual snobbery at play um, he doesn't go overboard on the punching down. It's clear that, you know, they want the riffraff. You know, art isn't for the riffraff. It has nothing to do with them. It's only them in their exalted sort of ivory towers. But that's not the focus of the humour. The focus is more in the sort of repetitive language. And uh, as I say, the writer, you know, Haber has really channeled Thomas Barnhard here. But he's not as good as Thomas Barnhard. Anyway, the book starts with... Um, you know, they've fallen out, and the reason they've fallen out is because the American uh, guy said on a, you know, a panel at an event that actually art should be opened out to everybody. Uh, it shouldn't just be for the intellectual elite. And the other guy, the, the Austrian, never, you know, doesn't forgive him for that. Pulls away, thinks he's not a serious academic because, you know, he, the American's also been married twice. And that, you know, that is seen to take him away from his true discipline of, of art. So they've fallen out, not spoken for many years, when an email turns up, which which um, the American describes as short. And when he prints it off, it's nine pages. So, you know, the gag is that's short for this other guy because he's so sort of detail oriented. And it's a pretty scathing email you know, reiterating all the reasons that, you know, he's angry, still angry with him, but he is on his deathbed in Berlin. Can he come and visit for one final time? So that's the start of the book, and we get all the backstory, you know, when they're both friends, and, they're, you know, they're sort of, you know, talking about this painting, they're sort of digging into the biography of, of this this painter about, you know, who's, who's completely sort of unknown. Um, and it turns out that... You know, he 
is riddled with syphilis, he goes blind, that these three paintings were towards the end of his career when he may not even be able to see, which would explain the two horrific paintings either side, and that the one that they truly like is uh, like emerges as an inner vision. But both of them are, are devout atheists. Yeah, I'm aware of the uh, contradiction in terms, the oxymoronity of that. And even though the painting is called St. Sebastian's Abyss and has lots of religious uh, imagery that they, they refer to, they both deny this has anything to do with religion. For them, it's about the apocalypse, but it's not a religious apocalypse. And they're both very taken with the apocalypse. That's what first drew them together as, as friends before they discovered the painting. So we get all this history how they fall out. Again, an example of the humour is after the collapse of the American second marriage, he has uh, what he describes himself as a rebound relationship. Uh, and he, you know, none of the women are named. They're all referred to the first wife, the second wife, or the woman clearly who was a rebound relationship. That's what I mean by the Barnhardian, and the repetition and the, the sort of slightly sneering, dismissive tone. Um, but I'd rather read Barnhard do it. And by the end, you know, uh, without spoilers, the whole world is turned, their whole world is turned upside down. But unlike, say, the reversal in uh, The Life of Pi, where the whole of the reality of the book is turned on, on its head and recontextualizes everything you've read before, here it's merely everything that these two men have believed and followed and practised. And we don't, I didn't care enough about them to feel that that was a tragedy in their lives, that they'd been wasting their time going down the wrong route on this painting. They didn't matter to me. They were so up their own intellectual arses that, you know, when they came down with a bump, you just think, yeah, well, what, what should they have expected? Anything but. So the, the payoff of the, of, the, of the punchline, really, even that didn't land. I'd, I'd sort of got very intolerant of these characters by then. Although it's a short book and I read through it quite quickly, I still felt it was a chore. So I give this two stars. And if you thought two stars was low, welcome to a one star review of Hangman by Maya Binyan, which is a debut novel, unfortunately for her. This is the worst book I read this year. Um, I know we've still got another month to go, but I can't see it being topped or in fact bottomed as being the worst book of the, that I've read this year. So a 55 year old man who is an exile uh, from his country because he was jailed and on release he escaped. And he is going back to his country of exile after 30 years, can't remember exactly how long, because he's had a call from his brother who's dying. Again, a sort of deathbed call. Um, and his wife packs his bag but it's all very vague that he doesn't really have an address of where his brother is. He just he'll land in his country and the mixture of the familiarity of when he used to live there, plus the family who are still there. It will work out kind of thing. Um, so he goes there and he encounters loads and loads of people who are terribly nice. Uh, but he himself is so passive, so without direction. That, they, that these characters all just talk, talk at him. Uh, and I'll come back to, to some of that in a minute. It reminded me of Outline by Rachel Cusk, but the difference there is, although the narrator and the protagonist of that novel wants to, wants to sort of almost derealise herself and not be there, or at least not be um, visible to other people, Cusk gives a reason what, what's going on emotionally, why the character feels that. There's none of that here. We're just told that this, this guy is absolutely passive. Um, so I'll give you an example. She paused. I think she had forgotten she was supposed to be talking to me rather than just saying things in my presence. And that sums up this book. It's a lot of people, diverse people, saying things in his presence that don't really mean anything to him, don't help him solve his dilemmas of how to get to his brother and he is not giving anything back he is not he is not targeting and directing his own thoughts to this this aim of, of visiting his brother he's a complete sort of passive being for these people to project them 
themselves on. So he meets sort of a missionaries, he meets two graduate students who are arguing whether history is doomed to repeat itself or whether history is actually the movement of revolution and change. And it's so undergraduate and the theory of, um, of missionaries and charity aid workers is is laid out here but again it's all very sort of high school level of, of argument. Increasingly he's being stripped away from himself that uh, he loses his luggage very quickly then he sort of he's in a bank trying to set up a deposit account for his brother even though all his own you know he's offering the identity of him with his name on not his brother's and the bank won't do it and he walks out of the bank in frustration but he's left all his ID there um, the missionary uh, sort of uh, forces all these donated clothes on him so he takes off his own clothes and ends up wearing all these smelly clothes so gradually he's been stripped away and stripped away and stripped away from himself but there is no self there's nothing there's, it's like an onion there's there's nothing at the core so the fact that he's being sort of recast with all these sort of random attributes is irrelevant and yes the book tries by the end to give us a whole new reality I really didn't care by then and even then that that sort of reversal didn't work for me it wasn't convincing it you know it didn't save the novel quality wise but it didn't even save the novel sort of plot plot and structure wise I'm just going to give you a paragraph here to give you an example of just how frustrated I was at this book being completely unanchored in anything my cousin kissed my cheek and then my other cousin kissed my other cheek they turned around and then they turned back around and then moving together they placed on my shoulders my third cousin's ugly leather jacket. My cousins walked outside and then they weren't anywhere. I walked outside and then my cousin's house didn't exist. The morning was quiet because it was too early for anyone to want to make noise. I saw a family of pigeons but they didn't say good morning because they had nothing to do with language. They just walked in a line not looking at anything. I walked alongside them. We walked down a road. When I realised I knew the road, the pigeons decided to fly away. I wanted to join them, but I could not join them, so I continued walking down the road. It led to one place only, a place that I knew well but did not want to know well, but now had to visit. I looked at the sun thinking it was still too early, but knowing that even if I believed it was still too early, whatever was going to happen to me was going to happen to me, because the time for it to happen had finally come. So I just found the whole book is like that. It's infuriating. There are all these events that sort of happen without any rhyme or reason, never explained. He's never really goal-oriented, even though he's there supposedly to visit his brother on his deathbed. Um, you know, the, some, some of the uh, blurbs on the back by other authors... Um, a subtle and peculiar novel about subtle and peculiar things. Home, exile, injustice, family return and life itself. Yeah, there is a theme of exile, but, yeah, it, it wasn't strongly enough linked. Um, a striking, masterful debut, a clean, sharp, piercing and deeply political novel. No, the politics is, is graduate level discussions in a bar when you're drunk late at night. Um... Bin Yan has written a remarkable book, one that builds beautifully. No, it doesn't. It just drifts along, as I say, unmoored and unanchored. A world that feels true. Mm, not sure about that. While well, dismantling the world that feels real. It doesn't dismantle anything. It's too passive. One star. And on to something much more satisfying. Translating House One by Pupe Misagi. So, as I say, this is a book uh, sort of set in Iran in 2009 after a hotly contested election result. There was a protest movement called the Green Movement and the Iranian regime clamped down on that pretty bloodily, as indeed it did last year with the, you know, sort of women taking off their their burqas and, uh, and their veils and, and things. Um, so the book starts with uh, the protagonist, female protagonist in Tehran, and she's on a bus and uh, buses are segregated, or at least they are in this book, you know, women at the back, men at the front. And she, I think, rather brilliantly sort of explains how that makes the journey through the city, not only makes the journey through the city a different experience for both the men and the women in the bus, it actually makes different cities that they're travelling through on the same bus. So it's not just the laughter and, and the sort of value system and 
the sheer nature of the journey for the women in the back compared with whatever's going on at the front with the men because she doesn't go into detail on that but it's just they are seeing a different type of city for which they are you know forbidden or at least you know completely trammeled in how they're able to traverse that city and she talks about um public arts you know statues of famous uh, artists and, and people like that that have started disappearing uh from from Tehran's uh, landscape because the morality police have decided that the artist is um, you know too suspect or the artwork is too provocative so she, she's decided she's going to sort of preserve the record of what of what statues used to be there uh, but that quickly mutates into uh, preserving an, a record of all the people killed and disappeared by the regime as part of the crackdown on the green mo movement and and very much channeling Bolano's uh, 2666, the chapter of the, of the missing women. And that she openly acknowledges that, you know, I haven't made that connection. She's, she's told us. Uh, I have to say I don't like that book, 2666, and I felt frustrated by that chapter in it. I didn't have the same feeling here because I think it's handled much more subtly, much more personally. You know, we get the sort of the bare facts of, you know, where they were you know, the data that they were killed, where they were killed, where they were buried, um, what their occupation was. But then we get the sort of, it broadened out history of, of it, um, you know, to remember them. And this book is questioning the whole time, you know, about remembering the dead, keeping the cause alive, keeping their torch alive. And, and, you know, is that the right thing to do? Are we even being truthful in what we do? And she writes, I think, really, really well on that. How do we fight the myth of the one and only truth? How do we move from the truth to truths? Who defines truths? Our truths. Embodying these truths, who do we become? Embodying these truths, who do the dead become? How can we know what the dead would have wanted? What if they don't want to be engraved in the minds of the people? What if they don't want to be heroes? Do we allow them the right to choose? What would that even look like? Do we stop and wonder for a moment who we, are, who we are to decide for them, for their narratives? Do we seek refuge in the uncertainty of dead bodies to defend ourselves against the uncertainties of the future? And also, towards the end, I think a, a sort of brilliant summation, really. Um, it is only by way of questions that the text can be transformed into a body that offers its wounds for examination and treatment opening itself up and inviting the writer and readers into its vulnerability and fragility. Without the questions, the book would become a manual and a postcard, a goddess posing for cameras, too pleased with her limbs and her arms, with her words and her voice. It might imagine itself as the authoritative text, the representative text, the text that will leave its mark on the literary landscape of this place and time. Failing to bear its gaps and failures to the readers, Growing too sure of itself, a closed text will suffer illusions of grandeur, will mimic the very forces it has set forth to expose and oppose. So that's why this is interlaced with the author questioning this drive to preserve the truth or to seek after truth, to preserve the memories of the dead, to Shanghai those the dead as martyrs for the cause. You know, there's a there's a, a meditation on the Iranian regime's use of martyrs, the word martyr, in during the Iraq-Iran war, as against the forbidding of the use of the word of martyr for anyone who was killed at the end of a police truncheon or on a water board or, or whatever. I just think this is a, a fantastic book about, you know, something that's probably not that well known about in the West, but has wider ramifications for any re authoritative regime that cracks down on protests. And I just thought it was really, really... You know, it sort of exploded in several different directions, but was also very self-contained. You know, it kept a rain and, and thereby focused my mind and my concentration on, on the ideas and the issues it was dealing with. Five stars. And on to The Yellow Arrow by Victor Pelerin, who's just been translated by Andrew Bromfield. So another one of um, Pelerin's short books. A couple of years ago, I read... Uh, the Hall of Singing Caryatis, which I love. 
this is solid but not quite as profound I feel as the Hall of Scene characters. Being Pelevin it's that mixture of satirical commentary on post-Soviet Russia um, and on the you know sort of everything that is wrong with post-Soviet Russia. He's not harking back to the Soviet days he's just going just talking about you know the state that Russia is in and this is written before the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but there's always with Pelevin that sort of Buddhist spiritualist side. So the Yellow Arrow is this train, which is a whole world in itself, almost a whole universe. Uh, it doesn't stop at stations. It's forever travelling towards a destination, which is called the Old Bridge. But no one quite seems to know sort of, you know, why the, why it's heading there, what their role is. Uh, as passengers, they only know that, um, you know, this is like their whole world. There is no world. There's a world outside they can see, but it's, you know, unpopulated, it's bleak. Um, and so because the whole world is centred inside this train, there's a whole set of morals and ethics and etiquette, how they bury their dead, uh, for example. The satire comes in the form of so the those running the dining car have struck a deal uh, whereby they sell all their spoons in in a barter economy, which is a metaphor for what the oligarchs have done with sort of Russia's you know great industries, um, and the spiritual side is obviously the the notion of a journey, but you don't know what the destination is, and all these sorts of things. It's good, it's solid, it's 80 odd pages, it won't take you long to read. But if you haven't read the Hall of Scene Characters, I think this is better on both the spiritual side, but also the, the beginning, the satire of, of uh, Russia. This starts with um, a group of uh, Russian prostitutes and it's, it's just brilliantly incisive. He, you know, as I say, they're not long books, but he gets to the heart of the matter so economically, so efficiently. Anyway, I gave this, I think, sort of three and a half, four stars. And just one more book, because uh, I've just finished reading it. This is a non-fiction, Photo, Phyto, Proto, Nitro, by Melissa McCarthy, who I think is British, but I went online and uh, I couldn't find, there's nothing on YouTube, and uh, I couldn't find, anyway. Uh, so this is five stars. Uh, it's a wonderful sort of imagistic meditation, really, um, which is sort of right up my street. It's highly subjective because of the associations of things uh, between things that she's making, um, which are admirable. Uh, there were several that, of those associations that I also felt, but even the ones I didn't, you could just sit back and bask in glory as she crosses time periods and cultures, drawing on things that have echoes with one another, uh, imagistically and also linguistically. Um, so it's basically, uh, it's a, about uh, photography or really cameras and all the things that stretch from that, the chemicals uh, that develop uh, pre-digitally, obviously, it's about the nature of perception and uh, perspective. It's about light and time. Uh, and cutting across those are sort of um, a set of obsessions, really. Um, sharks, nuclear weapons, um, flower pressing, um, all these sorts of things that keeps she keeps circling back on and her first book was on sharks and it's obviously very much an obsession with her um but the way that they come together it's it's like you know an octopus has a brain in every one of its eight tentacles as well as its sort of central nervous uh, system brain and it's a bit like that with these images that sort of keep coming back uh, on on one another um it was just it was just wonderful so if it's about um sort of associating images that don't nor people don't normally put together that makes it metaphor that makes it sort of you know trying to um uh address and explain one thing in terms of something else and that's why i say this is very much a meditation it's in four parts the first is the most sort of free flowing um sort of you know starting from one thing to another. The, the next three are much more rooted in the development of the camera, 
and certain types of photography and um but they even those sort of as i say contain these sort of recurrent motifs it was just wonderful stuff five stars um so that's it till next time thank you very much <laughs>